You're listening to Big Table, a podcast about books and conversation presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles. I'm your host, J.C. Gable. For each episode, we speak to one author about a singular book in a long-form interview. Each interview is then followed by a brief reading, sometimes from the same book being discussed, sometimes by a like-minded title and a different author. But every episode does retain a loose theme throughout, and is inspired by the work of radio host and oral historian Studs Terkel. Thanks for listening. Artist Grace Hardigan in 1990 led writer, journalist, and historian Mary Gabriel to the seed of an idea that became the book Ninth Street Women, published by Little Brown. In 2010, Mary began researching the book. It was released last year. This easy to read doorstopper is a 900 page tome to the 1940s and 50s art world, as told through five women artists Helen Frankenthaler, Grace Hardigan, Joan Mitchell, Elaine de Kooning, and Lee Krasner. In a sense, this is five biographies in one, a kaleidoscopic view of these women's lives, their work, and most importantly, the world around them. It's also the first such book to focus on the women's output of that period. I spoke with Mary Gabriel, who now resides in Ireland, about Ninth Street women and how she fell in love with these women's lives and the times they lived in a pre- and post-war New York City that no longer exists. Here's Mary Gabriel. This book arose out of a conversation I had in 1990 with Grace Hardigan. Um, but I, between 1990 and 2011, you know, it was just some, an idea that sort of haunted me. And I was involved in a lot of different things because I was a, a journalist with Reuters. And so I was in Washington and London and the Middle East and Africa and a lot of different places. But I was also always writing books because I needed to step out of the world I lived in as a journalist in order to kind of, first of all, make sense of what was going on around me. I find history does that in a wonderful way. It kind of puts things in perspective. And also, I just wanted to be creative in a different way, in a different way than I was as as an editor. Um, But when I finished my last book on Karl Marx, which I think I was published in 2011, I started looking for another subject. And... I spoke with my agent, and this Grace Hardigan conversation came back to me. Um, It had never really left me, but it came back to me, and I thought, you know, surely by now someone has done this story because it's so fantastic. But no one had, and and it was shocking to me. And so I I started to do it. Now, there's been a couple biographies written about some of these women um, in the intervening years. In fact, by now, all of them except Helen have had a proper biography, you know, soup to nuts. But... I wanted to tell a broader story because I wanted to tell not just the lives of these five women, but also the life of this art movement, and then embed that art movement in in 20th century history, American history, because I think one of the problems, and I don't know, you know if you agree, but one of the problems, I think, in telling art history, in telling the story of art, is it's often removed from life as if the artists weren't responding to what was going on around them or weren't somehow channeling the information and the upheaval. And these people, the abstract expressionists, lived through, you know, the most tumultuous decades of the 20th century, you know, the Depression, the Second World War, the atomic bomb, the McCarthy hearings. And and that that really impacted their work. They wouldn't have done the work they did if it had not been for those historic circumstances. And yet, we never hear about that. You know, it's become a, a theory, you know, what they applied, how they applied the paint or why there were flat surfaces as opposed to, you know, there may not be tomorrow because of the bomb. What do I paint now, you know, given that situation? So anyway, that, that was the genesis of this book. So you met Grace. You had this personal connection with her, but most of these artists had passed away. Um, yeah. Was that a difficult hill to climb? Yeah, by the time I started the book, all of them had died. Helen was the last artist to die, and, and she died... I think it was December 2012, so it was just before I would have had a chance to talk to her. 
by the end of her life, I don't think I would have been able to kind of get much from her because she wasn't well. But um, it, that's daunting. And, of course, you know, some people I would have really loved to have talked to because they had so much to say. But, you know, I was dealt this hand. You know, they were all dead. And, and what I did then was to try to make it as vibrant as possible. I went back to interviews, not just that they had done, and they had done many of them, some taped, some written, um, but all of their compatriots that I could find. I did a huge search. There's a, a place in a Smithsonian, um, an arm of the Smithsonian called the Archives of American Art in D.C. that has just the most incredible collection of material on American artists. And they have literally, I, I would say, hundreds if not thousands of interviews of artists through the years. And so I, I actually just did a keyword search for these women's names and listened to every single interview, every single tape, everything available that had ever mentioned them. And the story I came up with, based on these interviews and based on then others that people gave me and some that I did myself, because there were, luckily enough, some of their compatriots who, are still, who were still alive and are still alive. Um, so I got all of these voices talking in my head. And... And the thing that I was so struck by is that when you hear from the principals themselves in their own words, not having been digested or diluted by, you know, the likes of us, journalists, when you hear their words, you really come away with a different story from of that period. Now, Dory Ashton was someone I, I did have the pleasure and to interview, and I and she was really one of the most remarkable people I had ever met. She was dying. She had lung cancer, and she was on oxygen. And while I spoke with her, she must have had 25 cigarettes. And she was just absolutely a wild young thing still, even on her deathbed. And and the stories she told me were a lot like the stories Grace told me in that they were so alive and vivid and so in the moment, you know, in that period of history. And it really made me wonder, you know, as I see in the introduction, why don't, why didn't I know this? You know, why haven't I heard these voices? And I think that part of the problem is that the story of the abstract expressionist and mid-century American art has become the story of just a couple artists. And so it keeps getting narrower and narrower in the voices of the many, many, many participants, whether they were other artists or art historians or critics or poets or musicians, composers, you know, the whole gamut were in this wild, wonderful group together. Um, those voices have been lost, and and you need them to tell the whole story, and so that's what I tried to do in this book, hence the length. Do you think your work as a journalist and as an editor has really helped inform your ability to not just write on a deadline, but also be able to sort through it a lot, vast amounts of information? Definitely. I, I think that journalists rely on quotes, direct quotes a lot more, you know, and I always write books that way. And, um, you know, I, I have a feeling that, well, I know, I just don't have a feeling, I know that the people who I'm quoting can tell the story much better if I use a direct quote than I can by paraphrasing them. And so often art history especially is written in paraphrase. And as a reader, I always think, you know, well, I would rather hear what the person said rather than what the writer says they said. You know, let's hear the direct quote. And so I think that that's one of the things that I do in my book. The other thing is that because I was a journalist, you know, working in the real world of, you know, war and murder and politics and, you know, the whole thing, I I tend to see artists in that world as well, which is where they live. You know, you can't remove them from that. And so I think that's where this book arose. And I think that... um, I wrote it so that people who don't know anything about art history, you know, who definitely know what a Jackson Pollock is, but know nothing about him or why he did what he did, let alone who these five women were or what they did, what they, you know, why they did what they did. Someone can open this book and read it and not be intimidated by the subject or in any way lost by it. I don't use, you know, um, Term, art, art historical terminology. I don't use theoretical terminology. I just speak as if I were writing basically a magazine article, but it, you know, 900 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> To go back to one of the, I guess, sort of the teachers of a lot of these painters, 
I think until I read your book, I just didn't really realize the influence of Hans Hoffman on this whole movement. And there's some really candid moments in your book where either in New York or up up, uh, the coast in Provincetown um, that, that Hoffman really kind of instill a responsibility to society, I think you said, um, especially in the dark times they were living in. And, and, and I'm wondering, could this movement have happened without all of these expatriates escaping um, the turmoil of Europe? Because it yeah. seems like the influence was, you know, not necessarily inherently American, but American mm-hmm. through expatriate um, mm-hmm. prism. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point. You know, you can never say would it happen or wouldn't it happen, but I don't think it would have happened as it did. And what all of those people you mentioned did for these New York artists was that they, they gave them courage. Hans Hoffman, as a teacher, was you know pretty standard academic cubism. You know, and by and you know by 1940, cubism was kind of passe. I mean, it wasn't for the New Yorkers because they hadn't been exposed to it that much, but. It had been around for a while, so it wasn't really cutting edge. That's what Hoffman basically taught. But it wasn't so much what he taught, it was what he said, and what the likes of having Breton around or having Mondrian or having, you know, any of the, Max Ernst, any of the Europeans who fled basically Nazism to escape to New York during the war. It wasn't that the artists copied them, but they watched them and they said, Robert Motherwell had a really great quote. He saw, He's surrealist, and he said, you know, they were just average men. You know, before that, these, these artists had thought of them as gods. But looking at them on the street, they saw, hey, they look just like me. Maybe I can be a great artist, too. And that's what, that's the kind of the courage that these, the influence of these artists gave uh, the New York artists. Now, the interesting thing about the women is that they didn't have anybody to look to and say, hey, you know, she's doing that, maybe I can too. They had to take an even greater leap than the men did. The men, you have to realize, and it's hard to imagine, that at mid-century New York, America really had never had um, an art movement, you know, that moved the world. I mean, they hadn't, American artists would go to Europe and work, and they'd come back, and they'd be celebrated among a small group of collectors. But, you know, the general population, coast-to-coast population, didn't really know about art, care about art. That changed with the WPA in the 30s. But but even when these artists started kind of making breakthroughs in in the late 40s, they were still completely underground. You know, no one was encouraging them. No one cared about them. If anything, they were suspicious of them as possibly communists. And so the the, the courage that Hans Hoffman and these expatriates, or these, I'm sorry, these refugees gave the New York artists was the courage to take, to take chances, to be who they needed to be on campus, you know, to find a new voice, a new way of expression. And that they did, and they changed the, the nature of art, they changed modern art. Now, the women had to say, okay, nobody's encouraging me. No one is, I mean, there, were, there weren't even women artists. I mean, there were a handful, Georgia O'Keeffe, Mary Cassatt, you know, just a you know, maybe... If you look at the history of art that they would have known about at that time, if, if there were five women in all of the history of art that these women artists knew of, that was a lot. I would say maybe three. Um, they had to somehow imagine that they could not only do wild art that had never existed before, but that they could do it as women. So they were, they were really out there on a limb. And, and, Luckily for them, at the beginning at least, the men around them encouraged them. You know, there was no competition. There was no gender bias. They were all in it together because the stakes were so low. You know, they had nothing to lose. They weren't competing for anything. After the war, as economic prosperity happens, as much as people like to think back at that time as quaint, it was actually quite scary. There's the bomb. There's the, you know, the House of Un-American Activities Committee. And also just this kind of man with a gray flannel suit, sterile culture. And what struck me about a lot of these women is they had to almost go out of their way to even buck, you know, whatever their families wanted them to be doing. Uh, In the cases of some of them, they had children that they deposited with their parents so they could go and paint, which, you know, might look to some as, you know, irresponsible as the parent. But somehow when it was men doing that, no one really talked about that. But it, but when the women did it, then suddenly they were criticized for it. 
And I'm wondering if, if you could speak to that a little bit. As far as these women um, being outside of society, they were outside of the broader society, but within their group, they had been there, especially Lee Krasner from the beginning, you know, from 1929 when the Museum of Modern Art opened in New York and, and through the 30s when these artists kind of started meeting, not meeting each other, the men and the women, through the 40s during the war and, and after when all of the great um, artistic breakthroughs were happening. She had been part of it. Elaine de Kooning had been part of it. And so they were, I mean, I hate to use the expression, but they were really one of the boys. You know, they were there. No one, they were powerful figures. No one thought of them as, you know, little women. Both of them, interestingly enough, were wives of major painters. But and and I remember it historically as wives of. But at the time, Lee Krasner was a formidable, powerful painter, organizer, force in the art community. As was Elaine de Kooning. And in fact, you know, you asked me earlier whether the arrival of the refugees and Hans Hoffman changed the way this art movement evolved. These two women changed the way that art movement evolved. It wouldn't have happened the way it did if it hadn't been for them. And the younger ones, Grace Hardigan, Joan Mitchell, and Helen Frankenthaler, socially they had a more difficult time because Grace, for example, as you, as you said, had to give up her, she didn't have to, she chose to give up her son because she knew she couldn't be a mother and an artist and be taken seriously. A woman artist had a hard enough time. A woman who was a mother and an artist might as well not even bother to paint because there, she would have never been taken seriously. Joan Mitchell was um, so strong as, a, as an artist and personally, well, she was, she's an interesting character. She was a very fragile person, but so understood and believed in herself as an artist that she could have withstood any opprobrium from society um, that might have told her not to, to paint. Joan would not have even paid attention to it. Helen was so bold in every way and so privileged socially that she too could ignore it. So the younger generation were more aware of it um, because they came of age as artists in the 50s when, you know, the any sort of liberation that women had achieved in the 30s in the WPA and in the 40s in the war effort was, act, you know, was actively being um, squelched by the by the government, by the media, by whoever needed women to go back to the kitchen so men could get their job, you know, could return to their workforce. Those three younger women were affected by that, but it never really impacted their art. And out of all of the women who emerged from that group, those three were the ones who were heralded in, you know, mass circulation publications, and they got the most attention. In fact, Grace, who of all of the artists probably is the most forgotten today, was the one who was the most heralded in her time. That's interesting. And, and you stumbled upon this while doing the research, looking at old clips yeah. and whatnot. I, I think, too, what really came through in your book, which I think I sort of knew, but only as a footnote, was how much both Elaine and, and Lee Krasner put their own careers on hold in, in uh, you know, in favor of their husbands to champion their work. And Elaine, even more so in, in, in writing these articles for Art News, which was not just promoting um, her husband, but this whole scene. You know, it seems like without her early reportage on this stuff, um, it, would, it would have been hard to, to even start to begin to tell these stories. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. People, I mean, in one regard, you can say they put their careers on hold. Um, for their husbands. But on the other hand, I, I see it as something more than that. They both continued to paint. Um, they were both completely active in the scene. I don't think they put their careers on hold so much for their husbands as they put their, they sort of stepped out of the limelight creatively, as far as their studios go, in order to promote art. So, for example, Lee Krasner, it wasn't that she was being a good wife and trying to promote her husband. She was promoting this person named Jackson Pollock, who she believed um, was the greatest artist she had ever met and probably the greatest artist she thought the United States had ever produced. And Lee was known as having the best eye in the art world at that time for, for new painting, for great painting. And when she saw Pollock's work, she said, this is it. I mean, the, the earth moved for her. And so she dedicated herself to this very flawed man who she also happened to be in love with. 
not so much because of her love for him as her husband, but because of her love for him as this artist who she felt duty-bound to protect. And so I think that's a really interesting and, and important distinction to make. It wasn't that she was being a devoted wife as one, as one would expect in mid-century America. She was actually being a crusader for art, and in particular for this artist who she thought was going to change the nature of art, which exactly did, and no doubt wouldn't have if it hadn't been for Lee. Um, you know, he needed her to survive. And in fact, we saw that in his, she, she left him for a month, and within a month he was dead. So um, with Elaine, she, she was always, she's a very um, social person and incredibly intellectually voracious. And for her, she called herself a painter. She would always call herself a painter first, but that was never all she was. You know, she admitted she had 50 personalities and 50 areas of interest at any given moment. And the other one for her was writing. And so she used her talent as a writer to do what you just described, which was introduced to this world that had not a clue who these people were or what they were doing. I mean, this was a language that no one understood on campus. She used her, her skills as a writer to introduce these people to, um, to a greater audience. And she convinced the editor of Art News, Tom Hess, to allow her to, and in fact to hire other artists and poets in that scene to kind of expand the narrative. And so, yeah, without Elaine telling that story, I, I can't imagine how many years it would have taken, if it would have ever been, if they would have ever been recognized, because it was only through kind of the propaganda coming out of Art News that this um, this scene was was recognized by a broader audience. I guess this is kind of a loaded question, but it's two parts. Are the women you wrote about more widely known today than in their day? And do you think women artists in general are celebrated in a different way now than during this era? Um, well, I'll answer the second part first. There are obviously more women artists today but I think that their, um, their acceptance in the gallery culture and their financial success is not anywhere near representative, representative of the number of art, women artists with, that exist. So in other words, art schools are predominantly made up of women. You know, the stu- art, women, art stu- students are women. The majority of our students are women. But in the galleries at the most, maybe 30% of gallery artists are women. So that gives you an idea um, that something happens between the time of art school and the time that somebody's work is hanging on a gallery wall for sale. No, it's true. As far as these women... Yeah, the the numbers don't lie. (laughs) No, the numbers don't lie. And, you know, when I was doing this after the book, I I met a lot of younger women artists, and, and one of them said to me, and it was great to hear from her, she said, oh, yeah, you know, there's no problem anymore getting into galleries. You know, my friends and I don't even think about that. But I thought, oh, wow, great. You know, that's wonderful. She was in her early 20s. And then I talked to a slightly older artist, and she said, that's what, that's, that's you know, and, and this is a, the sad part of the story. She said, that's the experience when you get into entry-level galleries, group shows. They're available to everyone. But it's when people start investing real money that the, the kind of winnowing art out based on gender occurs. Um, and a perfect example of that is, and brings us to the women I'm writing about, last fall, yeah, the fall of 2018, there was a lot of buzz going into the auction season about this is women's time, they're being discovered, you know, the collectors are priced out of the market for the Jackson Pollocks and the Willem de Konings. They're now looking at these women who have been neglected for so long. They're going to lay down some big money for them. So there was, Christie's had an auction in the fall, and there was a magnificent Joan Mitchell painting. I mean, it absolutely beautiful painting and the range was I think 12 million to 16 million it was going to go for it should have gone for 40 million I mean it was that good of a painting and there was a Helen Frankenthaler that had never been on the market before from 1959 so it was a really rare painting again magnificent painting so auction night comes everybody was excited next morning I expected to wake up see headlines the records broken you know these paintings went for a lot the Helen Frankenthaler painting didn't even sell. And the Mitchell painting went for the mid-range. I think it sold for $14 million. So the money 
it just isn't there yet. And part of the problem is that um, after that auction, I was so depressed. I was talking. I talked to the cu- uh, curator at Christie's about it, and she said that the problem is one of education. That the people who are spending a lot of money on art still don't know enough about these artists. No matter how much you know my book about how many biographies have been written, it's not part of the the art history that people learn that. Um, Museum officials learn, you know, let's say, I should want the museum officials, let's say art advisors learn, so that when they go to tell someone, yeah, you know, you've got an extra 40 mil, why don't you buy, you know, John Mitchell's painting? They don't know about John Mitchell to the, to the extent that they think they can advise that kind of investment. And so the work still isn't going. So there's a lot, a lot to be done. Now, to your question, are these people better know, are my artists better known today than they were in her, their day? No. Um, they're known now, you know, and they're becoming better known, thank God. But in their day, they were, you could open Life Magazine and see Grace Harding and Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler splash across the pages. You know, Time Magazine had Grace. Newsweek had Grace. Um, Helen Frankenthaler was an Esquire. You know, they were, they were known, and people were buying their work. Grace used to sell out her shows. You can barely find a Grace Harding painting from the 50s because all of her shows sold. So... Meaning they're all in private collections today. They're all in private collections, yeah, or museum collections. And so there's a ton of work to be done, and the imbalance is still, you know, is still terrible and so frustrating and so impossible to understand, you know, that today, in this day and age, you would still value a beautiful work of art differently because of the, the name on the painting is the name of a woman. I mean, to me, it's, un, in, you know, impossible to imagine, but... That's still the case. Ninth Street Women by Mary Gabriel, published by Little Brown, is out now in paperback. This episode's reading features Celia Paul reading from her memoir, Self Portrait, published by the New York Review, which is also out now in hardcover. I'm not a portrait painter. If I'm anything, I've always been an autobiographer and a chronicler of my life and family. I have told my life in images. I am drawn to painting because the process of painting has always had meaning for me. It has the quality of a live performance with all its unforeseen risks and the knowledge that what you do can never be exactly repeated. If you destroy a painting in order to go deeper, There is no way you can bring the lost image back to life again. I am attracted to painting rather than to sculpture, say, because an object in the middle of a room or space, however powerful, is no match for the intensity of focus demanded by a painting fastened to a wall. When I was a young woman, I kept a diary. I wrote down my thoughts and feelings, mostly about Lucien Freud, with whom I was in a relationship. I was 18 years old when I met him, and I was 28 when I officially split up with him, though we were to remain connected until his death through our son, Frank Paul, and through painting. In the diary, my thoughts and feelings are written down in prose that is highly charged and often overwrought. The threaded through this turbulent prose are a few poems. The poems serve the purpose of rising above the chaotic emotion giving a bird's eye view and distance, allowing the possibility of giving a shape to the chaos and perhaps to create beauty too. The poetry formed a bridge towards the unspoken language of painting. I could distance myself from the written word and make a new painted language for myself. Painting gave me freedom of speech. Gradually, painting took over from the prose, the poetry, and from any words at all. I only ever work from people and places that I know well. This insider knowledge gives me freedom to take liberties with the forms and structures of the faces and figures, the clouds, the waves, the houses. When I don't know a subject well, I am much more literal in my attempt to represent them. I need to get the distance between their nose and mouth, 
the shape of their forehead right in order to try and get a likeness. If I know my subject well, it's almost as if I don't need to look at them in order to give them intense attention. And yet I need their physical presence. By using the voice of my young self in the notebook entries and by recording my memories of that time, through the vividness of the past and the measured detachment of the present, I am aware as never before that there is an unbroken connection between the two. I have always been, and I remain at nearly 60, the same person I was as a teenager when I first met Lucian, and as a child in India when I sat so still in the beautiful garden of our house in Trivandrum that the butterflies landed on me. This simple realisation seems to me to be complex and profoundly liberating. Big Table is produced and presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles, and is supported by Invisible Republic, a nonprofit arts organization based in Chicago and Los Angeles. You can learn more about their community based programs and publications at invisiblerepublic.org. Big Table would not exist in the audio world without the expert skill sets, friendship, and dedication of sound designer Matea Bain and audio engineer Jacob Ross. Special thanks to Eric Gorman at Gold Diggers and Alejandro Ale Cohen at Dub Lab for early encouragement and engineering prowess. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.